once I made that decision to pursue it full time and took the kind of not so great situation and just, okay, well, maybe this is an opportunity for me to see how this goes. I find that once I made that decision, things started to really pick up at a much quicker pace. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the podcast. Today, we are talking with Tears of Forrester, who is the artist and creator behind the brand Tears of Lane Art. If you haven't checked out her artwork and her products, she makes a ton of really cool products and items all the way from wild rags up to stationery. So if you haven't checked those out, you can go look on the Herd Co. website. We have a few of her products there. In this episode, we're going to dive into Tears's background and learn where she comes from and how she started creating her art in the first place and what it's grown to be today. So I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I do. It was really a pleasure speaking with Tirza. In order to support other small businesses like Tirza Lane Art that we have on the Herd Co. website, we ask that you share, subscribe, or like this video or podcast and share it with a friend. Every like helps support a small business and every share helps that small business grow. And with that, let's dive right into the episode. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another episode. Today, we are joined by Tirza Forrester, who is the creator and founder behind Tirza Lane Art. Welcome. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I am good. Thank you for joining us, and we're just excited to hear more about your story and about your brand. But before we get started, give everyone sort of an overview and a background of where you're from, where you live, your sort of origin story of what makes you you. Yeah, so I am a native Oregonian. I grew up in the Portland area and then moved over to Central Oregon. I live in Bend about six years ago. Yeah, I'm an I love the outdoors. I originally was a landscape painter and that's what, how I started and then kind of evolved into my love all things western and cowgirl and has evolved into my now art and station, mostly stationary line. And yeah, I'm a wife and a mother to a little girl. I have a hound and What's um, her name? Just, her name is Charlotte. And um she's not quite at the age where she can help me yet but she is (laughs) yeah she'll be ready for farm chores soon (laughs) oh yeah oh she's already helping her dad like push the carts of wood around and like doing all sorts of things he has her following him around so it's really cute what else I think that's kind of a little bit about me that was really vague but yeah grew up in Oregon love (laughs) her yeah So you, has your family been in Oregon? Did you, have you been there your entire life? Is your, your grandmother, I know, and your great grandmother are a big part of your story. Are they all from Oregon? Yeah. So you can track my lineage back to like the Mayflower, but my family moved out West in the mid 1800s and they all settled in Utah. And my great, great grandmother, her name is Desdemona Beeson. um, She ran and operated the mines and this was during like um, World War II or like kind of at the end of World War II. So it was during a time where women took over men, man's job because they were off at war and the men returned and she's, she was like, um, no, you're not having your job back. I'm in charge. <laughs> and um, so she was someone that people talk about that you didn't want to mess with. And she ran and operated multiple mines. Um, if you know where Snowbird is in Utah, the big ski resort, they purchased the land um, it's in the Wasatch mountain range and they purchased the land from my, my family to build that giant resort. So, oh wow, um, yeah. So before then it was, um, the Alta mine, which was ran by my family. So, and it just, you don't hear like of women really, and being as educated as she was, and then working in the mines and being in charge, it's just unheard of. And then my great grandmother. She was an artist and also grew up in Utah and then moved to the Oregon coast. And she just kind of fostered my love for art. And I have like really fond memories of going and visiting her. She lived in like kind of the Redwoods area of of like Northern California, um, Southern Oregon. And 
we would like look for, we would press flowers um, and find wildflowers near her cabin. And she just had a really independent and gentle spirit about her. And I still have some of her art and the art that we did together hanging up in my house. And yeah, so she was just really special as well. And of course, my mom is like my biggest cheerleader. And so are my two grandmas who are still alive. Yeah, it's just the women in my family, I've just had a lineage of like independence and empowerment. And I find that that's important to like carry through my art and just that love of the West and Western culture and lifestyle just kind of embodies that as well. So, so yeah, they're a huge inspiration to my, to what I do. It sounds like you come from a very strong line of women and I'm sure Charlotte is going to be the next of that line. So very exciting. Oh, yeah. She definitely has her own opinions about things already a a year and a half. So, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, of course she does. So a lot of your paintings, you have like the cowgirl-esque paintings, but then you also have your landscapes and your florals. And then when you go on your Instagram, I see a lot of your, your floral collections and bouquets that you put together. Is that floral side and landscape side coming from your great grandmother? I would say so. Yeah. And I think, yeah, just those memory, fond memories of going out in nature with her is like, I love, I go for walks almost every day. Usually we have a really robust garden. So I like plant a lot of flowers and that's really important to me. That's kind of like my outlet and hobby outside of my art is like I get to be creative and create with within like my garden which I love so yeah I think it's partly like due to her and then just you know where I live it's easy to be inspired I can you know drive down the road and see the mountains and that's pretty cool not many people get to say that and so I feel very like privileged and grateful to live where I live and that definitely kind of inspired my journey of you know painting the landscapes and the florals kind of has sparked out of like other interests in my life. So yeah. I actually just went out west to visit. Both of my sisters are in Colorado. And so me and my mom got to go out there and it's just a totally different landscape than on the yes. East Coast. We went to Zion National Park and it was so I beautiful. Just yeah. the red rocks, the streams. Like when I look at your paintings, I see a lot of that landscape reflected and it's just so beautiful, so different from what I'm used to. And you're just in awe. Sunrise and sunset, we were waking up and just the rocks being illuminated by the sun. I was like, oh, this is just something else. Yeah. It's amazing. Sort of paint a picture for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Paint a picture for everyone, sort of like where you are, your barn renovation, which if you haven't seen that on her Instagram, go check it out. But I love sort of the oasis and creative space that you have created for yourself and your family. Yeah. So when we bought this, our property that we live on, I saw the barn and immediately was like, this is where I want my studio. It was, it's been for the last five years, just mostly storage and um, my husband's workshop. And so, but it had this big space that we think was previously used for an RV slot and we don't have an RV. So we didn't really have any use. We felt like it was unused space. And so this last December, I just got, I was like, I had had it and I was like, I have to move my, all this stuff. It was taking over our whole house. (laughs) all over the kitchen table and actual kitchen. It was everywhere. And so I started cleaning out all the cleaning out the barn. I called my neighbors and I was like, can you watch Charlotte? I'm on a mission. And so I, (laughs) we took our neighbor's trailer and like filled it up with just stuff that we had didn't need. And that like was left at the house that we didn't get rid of, cleared out the whole thing. And that kind of catalyzed the remodel. And so pretty much all of it, was remodeled by my husband. Um, A lot of people ask if my husband is a contractor. Um, No, (laughs) he's a mental health therapist. (laughs) Self-proclaimed. A YouTube contractor. (laughs) Um, We've done a lot of renovations. Many talents. Yes. Yeah. I'm thankful to have him. So we've done a lot of like renovations on our home. So we had an idea of what we were getting ourselves into. And so we just took apart some of the pieces of the barn, drill holes for new doors. And it took about six months of like working on the weekends and just working during nap time and all that stuff. So he worked really hard on that. So I can 
thank him for that. And it's a beautiful space and it's just great to have it. You know, it has so much light and hopefully I can have it as a space to like maybe have workshops in the future and things like that. So, but yeah, so that it's kind of that. And it was fully funded by in cash with my business. So, and that was kind of the goal of like, I don't want to have to go into that. Yeah. To pay for this. And so, so I'm really proud of that as well. So, yeah. Yeah. It's like the baby born from your business. I love that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) We'll take us back a little bit to before you created this brand, what you did previously, and then how that time period in your life looked. And then when you decided, hey, I'm going to give this a go and what that transition looked like. Yeah. So I have had a lot of jobs, but my (laughs) previous career before this, I was a middle school teacher. I taught art, social studies, sometimes science. Yeah. So I was kind of jumping around to different schools. I was like working temporary teaching positions. It's really competitive to get a teaching job and have a career here in Bend. And so I had worked in the schools and other roles and then got my license and then was teaching. Um, Anyway, long story short, I didn't love it. I like working with kids and I like the creative side that teaching that's involved with that the bureaucracy of schools and having to deal with discipline just kind of wears on you. And so anyway, there was just the last school I worked with. They laid me off last year, like a year and a half ago now. And up until that point, I had just been working on my art business on the side and it was a great like additional income and it had started to grow, but it kind of grew with like the amount of time that I had to devote to it. And so when I was laid off, I kind of had a choice and I just had my daughter. And so I had a new baby at home and I had to decide, was it going to look for a new teaching position? And I really didn't love where I was at. And I just couldn't see myself doing that any longer, even though it was a very short lived career. I really wanted to work for myself. Being a teacher, you just feel like you're just not doing enough all the time. You just feel like you're just never quite enough um, or you're not doing the right teaching method or whatever it may be. And so I just was tired of having that feeling. And so I decided to just take it on full time with a newborn (laughs) and um, (laughs) to give it all that I had. Time-wise, financially, just to not be afraid of spending the money that I needed to get things going and the time, which was really scary, but a lot of things lined up in the way that they needed to. And yeah, it was like once I made that decision to pursue it full time and took the kind of not so great situation and just, okay, well, maybe this is an opportunity for me to see how this goes. I find that once I made that decision, like things started to really pick up at a much quicker pace. And so, um, so that was a cool transition. It was definitely scary because it was like, okay, well, I could go back to work. I do have a fail safe, but I haven't looked back since. So that was about a year and a half ago. So, yeah. It's almost like that the scariness is what propels you forward at a faster pace. You're like, I have to make this work. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And that's where I was at. Like I had to make it work. I didn't really have the choice. I mean, I did at the end of the day, but at the same time, it all seemed to be pointing that way. So yeah. Yeah. I love that. I want to take a quick second and ask if you've liked this episode so far, if you could like, share, or subscribe to this video or podcast. Every like helps support a small business and every share helps that business grow. And with that, let's get back to the episode. So talk us through, so your business has multiple different facets going, right? So you have your products, you have your artwork that goes into your products. You also do branding Mm -hmm. you do your own branding very well as well. But talk us through sort of those different parts of your business and how you got into each one and maybe which is your favorite or which you enjoy doing the most. Yeah, I'd say I enjoy, well, I enjoy all aspects of my business for different reasons, but I'd say my favorite is my product side. I love having a physical product to like have in my hands that has my artwork on it. Um, It's a really good feeling. It doesn't come without its challenges though. Running a product-based business is 
hard <laughs> finding the right price points and the right lead times for things and making sure things arrive on time. And if they come damaged, which happened last week, then you have to reorder anyway. So there are like downsides to a uh, product base, but I do love that. And then I also, yeah, I do a lot of branding work. So branding kind of came on accident. I had someone, it was nothing I was like intentionally pursuing. I had someone, um, a, my hairstylist actually, she approached me. She's like, Hey, can you do my logo for my salon? And I was like, I guess. And, um, <laughs> I like quoted her some really low number, which was fine. Cause I had no idea what to charge for that <laughs> and, um, created her logo and she's loved it ever since. And so I was like, Oh, well maybe more people. And then more people kept asking me for their custom logos. And so it's just kind of evolved like on its own. Um, in that way. And it's been a really fun way to help other brands kind of elevate their brand and their brand story. So I've done like album covers for a musician. I've done a lot of just business branding um, for, you know, boutiques and for bars. And um, what was one recent one I did? Uh, yeah, for boutique owners mostly, but yeah, all sorts of different things. So it's fun to see what people have in mind and the ideas that they bring to me and then to bring that to life and to work with people because my job with products is just by myself. And so it's nice to have that different aspect of my business. Yeah. So, and then I do, I'm hoping to, since I am, I was a teacher, I do like the education part. And so in the next couple of years, I hope to incorporate a more educational piece or helping people through the branding process a little bit more. So, yeah. Yeah. One thing I noticed about your Instagram and your shared life on there is that you as a person are very on brand with your colors. I was looking <laughs> at your your barn remodel and I was like, hmm, this looks a lot like her <laughs> brand colors. <laughs> It's like, you know, your brand colors and you stick to them. <laughs> yes. Like my whole wardrobe. I'm like, oh gosh. I mean, like it's the reason I pick my brand colors, right? Because like everything I wear is like red and yellow and you know, that like turquoise blue and things like that. Yeah. My house is that way too. So <laughs> I, <love> um, it. <laughs> I live my brand. It's not on purpose. Yes. We're not on. Yeah. Not always on purpose. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, when people go look at your website, they're going to see a bunch of different things that you offer. But throughout all of them, there's a cowgirl theme running through. Can you talk us through sort of how that comes into your life or plays into your life? And then talk us through, take us back to the beginning of sort of when you first had horses in your life and what that looks like now. Yeah. So my, like the cowgirl Western theme. So my husband is like fifth generation Texan. And they own a big ranch in Texas. And so about 15 years ago, you know, I got to go to the ranch for the first time. Now we go every year or sometimes twice a year. And it's just a really special place. It's been in their family for over 100 years. And so, or no, almost 100, not quite. And so that being introduced to that, just like a different way of life, really, I just loved it and fell in love with it and love, get, look forward to going to the ranch every year and and just being a part of that, whether it's like, you know, feeding the cows or filling feeders, um, they own a big gaming ranch. And so, yeah, it's just that has kind of instilled that. And then I'm fairly new to the equestrian community. And it's something that I've always, I've always wanted to learn how to ride and just never was quite introduced to it as a kid. And so I've taken it on as an adult. And which I think a lot of people don't really do because I think especially riding horses can be really intimidating unless like you've been riding them for a while, but I decided to take it on. I have a really great trainer. She's actually my neighbor. And so she's been really helping me this past year be a confident horsewoman. And so I'm really grateful for her and just like how inviting she has been to me and for learning a new thing. And so anyway, I've always like wanted to ride and own horses. So hopefully in the next year, she'll help me purchase my first horse. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah. Yay. I yeah. Excited. I think it is like you were saying, it is common to see people start riding at a very, very young age, yeah. but I'm similar to you. I didn't start until college and at, even then. So I'm like, what, 20, 
I was like 21 or maybe 19 when I started. But even then I felt I felt that same feeling of, wow, everyone's been in this community for so long and I'm brand new. But I think it is important that people see that you can be an adult and start taking your walk trot lessons and it's totally fine and normal and it's the same amount of fun. Let me tell you that. (laughs) It's just been like really fun to learn something new and that's challenging. That's outside of like my business and outside of any thing that I else that I do and so I really love that component I can just like zone out and focus and yeah what kind of writing have you been learning to do and what's your favorite thing that you've done so far so I spent a long time in the walk and trot and then um we've been doing some yeah a long time there she's like you need to relax (laughs) (laughs) um yeah my trainer goes are you breathing I'm like I don't know (laughs) And then we've been really working on our loping patterns the last month or so, getting that down and just learning to, yeah, just have more control and working on turning and learning the basics. And she has, she built a fun new um, trail course on her property. And so we've been doing that. And so, yeah, I'm just taking it easy at this point. I just, in my head, I have some goals that I want to work towards, but I'm kind of seeing where things kind of go. So, yeah. Keep them close to the chest. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I like it. Well, talk us through um, some of specifically how you design some of your products. So I know you design through multiple mediums, but what are those mediums and what does that process look like? How do you come up with the ideas? What's your full creative process and walk us through that? Yeah. So I use a variety of mediums. I first, like I started off using um, strictly acrylic and painted with acrylic for many, many years. And then started incorporating like my hand, like ink hand drawings. And then I would take those and edit them in Illustrator. And then I, um, nowadays I actually use my iPad for a lot of things. Um, It's like, doesn't cost me any money in paint and paint is very expensive. It, I can take it everywhere with me. And just like the season of my life, I can get art done and produce like quality things in a shorter, not necessarily shorter, but like I can sit on my couch or I can sit at the airport or I can, you know, I can take it with me. And so a lot of my work recently has been more digital painting. And so, um, which has been really fun. So, but I, I hope to get to a place where I can, you know, build my business to a place they want it to be and then trans like, work on larger scale paintings again. Um, It's just not in the season of life or my business that I'm at, but I hope to get back to that because I do really enjoy painting, painting, but I Mm -hmm. really appreciate that there are so many ways to create art that are accessible. And so that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. Yeah. Did you learn all of those different mediums through your initial job as a landscape? What, what's the title? Landscape artist? Artist. Yeah. (laughs) Um, okay. Did you learn that there? Yeah, I I took quite a few courses in college. So I learned like the basics of like oil painting and like how to do everything really formally. And then I kind of just took that and translated it into my own style. Like looking back at my paintings from college, I noticed that I, even my style was present there, which is kind of cool to see. But yeah, so it's kind of evolved from there. Yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So before you were digital, you were hand painting large scale and then turning that into the digital product. So even the cards, the Mm -hmm. prints and your scarves. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. And some of the stuff you'll see are like some of it is based off an original painting and some of it isn't. It really depends what it is. But yeah, I use a wide variety of things, but people never know. Like sometimes people will ask me for a digital painting and be like, do you have the original? And I'm like, oh, my iPad. <laughs> so Yeah, I'm sure people would love to buy and own the the massive original artwork as well. Yeah, yeah. So I'll get back to that place. It's just, you know, it takes a lot of time. And with painting, especially with acrylic painting, you have to paint for hours. Like it's not just like a pick up and do for a couple of minutes. It's like hours long process of like if you're in a place you can't really stop and like you know leave it and come back um so but yeah I'll get there again yeah 
And I'm sure having a baby is also a massive yes. time portion that doesn't allow yes. for that currently. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, yeah sure. well, talk us through. So on your blog, if y'all haven't seen her blog, what's the name of your blog for everyone listening? Yeah, it's Beyond the Brim. Okay, so, so on Beyond the Brim, you talk about the different ways that you can get unblocked if you're having a creative block. What are your top ways that you do that that might help someone else who's creative and sort of experiencing those same blocks that everyone goes through? Yeah, so my biggest one is I like to go on walks. My daughter loves going on walks too, so that's kind of also why I go. It gets her out and it gets me to like just be present and so whether it's just like walking down our road or like going on a local trail, getting out and walking helps me. And if there's no one on the trail, I'll just like talk to myself <laughs> and like verbally process. Yeah. I'm a huge verbal processor. And so sometimes I just need to like talk things out. If I really need to talk something out, I'll go with a friend and have them listen to me ramble on. But walking is a huge one for me. Another one is like having a list and either like I have my own list of like things I would like to get to as far as like subject matters or like different themes. And so just like referring back to that is helpful or even just like looking up prompts online just to get creating. I think as a business owner and being an artist, it's sometimes hard to find like to justify the time just to create without that like need to sell it. But I think that creative process is really important to have that piece and not feel like the pressure to sell everything. Like there's thousands of drawings and paintings that no one will ever see. And that's okay. Like that's just part of my process. And I think I wrote that blog post a while ago. I'm like, what else did I put in there? <laughs> um, let me think what else I did. I think those, I mean, those two are like the main things. And then I think I also wrote like the importance of just starting anyway, like for me to yeah. keep my, you know, business going, like I don't, I mean, I don't have to do anything, but at the same time, like I, I kind of do like, that's part of my, my job that I've created for myself. And so I find that once I get started, things kind of, I start having a good time and realize that I have more ideas than I thought I did or started with. Also thinking of like a product you have in mind sometimes helps like, oh, I want to put this on a tea towel or a journal or a t-shirt thinking like retroactively can kind of help with that process too, of like what the finished product or whatever you're doing with it may look like. So, yeah. Yeah. I've learned. So I'm very much in my creative side, which I don't even really claim to be super creative, I'm very much like the math and science child of my family, but I've been sort of experimenting and learning to be creative and just allow myself to call myself creative this year. So like exploring awesome. what that looks like, but I'm very much like, I have a hard time like forcing myself into it, but I've learned with a business that like you were saying, just taking that one action step gets you closer to that momentum of, oh, I might not be feeling this, but I could still get myself into that zone by just taking this one small step and knowing, yep. hey, it might not be the best step, but it's at least a step forward and it's better than doing nothing and waiting than feeling bad about not doing anything. <laughs> right, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. Talk me through how your experience with horses, even your recent experiences, have influenced your products and your designs that you've created. Yeah. Well, at this point, everything is about horses and the Western like lifestyle and <laughs> ranching lifestyle. And it wasn't that way yes. when I began, but now it's, um, and I, I was a little afraid to niche down as much as I, I currently am. But the moment I decided to really niche down, um, I found way more success in that because now I'm known for what I create. And so that has really benefited me. So yeah, I just love the response that I've gotten from my customers, um, my retailers, of uh, the products that I'm able to provide in stores of, um, especially retailers saying, you know, we have nothing like this and we're super grateful that you make all these varieties of cards and stationery and to serve the, you know, Western and equestrian community. And so I 
unintentionally filled a white space in the market that I, it was entire, like it wasn't on accident. I think it was like over time intentional, but like, it wasn't just like, I'm going to make Western art and that's it. Like that was never like a, like a definitive decision for me, but it's just evolved and it's like definitely who I am. And I love all things Western, Western style. I have like 10 pairs of cowboy boots and like all my (laughs) hats and my turquoise. Like I'm, I'm obsessed and I've embraced it and not all my friends are that way. So sometimes they show up and they're like, wow, I got quite the outfit on. I was like, yes, I do. Yes, I do. So yeah, I'm just, yeah, I just, I love the, just the lifestyle of it and how it's just hard work and, but also like from a woman's perspective, being feminine and there's a lot of like masculine and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just, I see a lot of that in the art world reflected and I just bring a very colorful and feminine vibe to it, which is different. So yeah. Yeah. With all of your colors and your expressive artwork, what are you hoping to make people feel and sort of experience when they do buy your artwork and wear your wild rags? Yeah, I think it's just like an experience, like a a self-expression. And that's why I decided to make wild rags because I love fashion. I love style and I love clothing and all that kind of stuff. And so just feeling like unique and my, my slogan is like vibrant cowgirl art for the, or vibrant Western art for the unconventional cowgirl. And I think I definitely want to like strive to have people feel that way. Like the that what they're wearing is unique or what they're giving as a gift is unique, but it also serves a functional purpose. Cards are functional in a way. And so are is like planners and things like that. And yeah, just like providing something that just makes people feel like unique and included and fun and upbeat and vibrant and all that good stuff. So yeah. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> What are some of your upcoming plans for your company? And do you have any new and exciting things that you can share with us? Yeah. So I work on a lot of things behind the scenes that um, never make it to Instagram. Sometimes I go through days and I'm like, (laughs) oh, I haven't shared anything. But I am adding some new product lines. Um, I'm going to be adding some home accessories as well as some more clothing accessories like headbands and scrunchies and things like that. That probably won't be till like next year. I'm at a place where I like really do my research before I add a new product and make sure I'm like finding the right supplier. But yeah, I have a lot of different things in the works and new patterns and designs that no one has seen yet, new wild rags. And my biggest goal right now is to grow, well, grow my website, but also I'm in almost 200 stores worldwide. And so growing my wholesale business. So I will be at the WESA trade show in January. And so Oregon girls going to Dallas. And um, so that's, yeah. It'll be quite the event. So um, that's kind of where I'm headed. I'm going to be present in more events next year. And yeah, just kind of taking it one step at a time. But my brain is already like we're in the holidays, but my brain is like spring collection. So um, yeah, yeah, just like the mind of a product-based business is like you're three months ahead of everyone else in your head. So yeah, but yeah, lots of exciting things um, in the works for sure. Yeah, that all sounds great. While we have you here and while you're wearing your wild rag, I was wondering if you could show people the different ways to style it. Yeah, sure. So obviously this is one way. This is my favorite way because you can wear like a a necklace and you can still see it. Another way that you can wear this is uh, the way I love to wear is in my hair. So if you just tie it and these are the short ones. These are mostly what I sell. I feel like they're a little more versatile than the long ones, just because you can, the long ones are harder to put in your hair. So anyway, I like it like that. I also wear it as, it's like the perfect length for a headband. So you can wear it as a headband and there's, my hair's in the way. There we go. Um, Plenty of length back here to like tie it twice and you can kind of tie it however tight you want. Um, I've also seen the trend 
of like scarves on bags. That seems to be like really trending right now. So yeah, just sticking your scarf on your bag. That's also nice to do because then you always have an accessory with you if you need it to dress up an outfit or put it in your hair or whatever. Also wearing them around your wrist. This wraps like three times around. You might need someone to help you tie it, but I'll just kind of show you like wearing yeah. it like a lot. It kind of acts as like a, like a cuff, which is fun. And then, yeah, I think that was five ways. Yeah. Yeah. I love so, it. I wear a scarf on my bag all the time. Yeah. I love that, that method. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because then, you know, you don't feel bad about not wearing your scarf because it's sometimes you have to think about grabbing your scarf before you leave the house or whatever. But that way you have it with yeah. you and it adds some, you know, style to your bag. So, yeah. I, I love that. it. Well, thank you. And to sort of round this call out or this interview out, if you could go back in time and tell yourself, young Tirza, when you are first starting your business and even when you were first starting out joining the equestrian community, what advice would you give your younger self? Um, I think I would say that you don't have to have it all figured out and that you don't have to know all the answers and like that there's no right way to do something. I think sometimes we don't do something because the internet or social media says like, you have to do it this way. Like for example, like art prints, like there's so many ways you can take your painting and make it an art print. That was like, I remember looking back, like one of the biggest hurdles to my business and that was so scary at the time looking now, I'm like, well, that was ridiculous. Like I obviously, that's not that hard, but <laughs> at the time it was hard. And I think, yeah, just telling like my, like if I were to go back and tell, you know, my past self is just like, there's no right or wrong way. Just keep going and to be consistent and keep going. I think that's really the key is just continuing to show up and being consistent matters more than like how good you are at art, like at the, or how good you are at your craft, like that will come over time. Cause like, if you do it full time, like you're going to be good at it because you get practice. So, so yeah, just continuing to show up, I think is bigger than a lot of things. So yeah. Yeah. That's great advice. I know I myself also would need to hear that as well as I'm sure many others in yeah. the equestrian yeah. community and in just starting your own brand. That's right. very pertinent advice. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us and sharing a little bit about your life and about your brand. And for everyone listening, tell them where they can find you on socials. And then we'll be releasing a little bit later how you can find Tears's products on the Herd & Co. website. Yeah, so you can find me on social on Instagram, just at Tears of Lane Art. So T I R Z A H L A N E Art. And then I'm also on Facebook under Tears of Lane Art. I don't ever post there, so just follow me on Instagram. It's probably the best <laughs> place. Um, but if you use Facebook, you can follow me there too. So um, yeah. Well, thank you so, so much. And we look forward to sharing your products and your artwork with everyone in the Herd & Co. Marketplace. Awesome. I look forward to it too. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. And we'll talk to you later. Thank you all so much for tuning in. It means a lot to both me and the small businesses that I support. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review. I'd love to hear from you. If you or anyone you know is a small equestrian business and you think that you might be a great fit for the Herd & Co. Marketplace, I would love to hear from you. You can contact me on socials, either on Instagram at Herd & Co. Markets or on Facebook at Herd & Co. Markets as well. Or you can just reach out to me directly through email. My email is virginia at Herd and comarkets.com. I look forward to hearing from you. And with that, tune into the next episode. And remember, you belong here. I'll see you next time.